There's no objection, members. I think we should uh, we should get started. Uh, I thought I saw Mr. Blumenfeld. Anyway, this is uh, Tuesday, March 23rd, the meeting of the Economic Development and Jobs Committee of the Los Angeles City Council. Uh, Curran Price, Chair, I'm honored to be joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Remen, Precepts Dawson, Corian. Uh, and um, I saw Bob Blumenfeld. But Mr. Clerk, would you get us started, please? Oh, uh, yes. We'll start with the roll. Councilmember Price? Here. Councilmember Krikorian? Here. Councilmember Blumenfield? Okay, we'll move on. Councilmember Rahman? Here. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Present. Okay. Uh, we're going to uh, move forward with uh, public comment. Mr. Clerk, would you please uh, inform us of how we can fully participate in this meeting? Yes, sir. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-177-1578 and press the pound key. Press the pound key again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Please note at this time it's public comment as pertains to the regular agenda. Caller ending in 1812, press star six to unmute yourself. And Mr. Chair, just for the record, uh, Bob Blumenfield is right. Sorry I'm late. That's okay, Bob, welcome aboard. Thank you. Caller ending in 1812, press star six to unmute yourself. Caller ending in 1575, press star six to unmute yourself. Caller, are you there? Yes, uh, like to speak on item number seven in general public comment. Okay, you have a, a minute for each item, you may start. Great, thank you. Hi, this is Katie McEwen, staff attorney with public council and member of the LA Street Vending Campaign. We're enthusiastically in support of a moratorium on enforcement and citations under the local vending program. As a legal aid organization, we've helped dozens of vendors with ACE citations over the life of the program. Almost all of these clients are extremely low income and have been working hard to understand and follow the rules and regulations of the program. Many of our clients have obtained the prerequisite li licenses that they need, including a seller's permit, a local city business license, and a food handler's permit, which provides the necessary training for the safe handling of food. But despite these good faith attempts to become compliant, many vendors can't obtain a county health permit because of the lack of code compliant carts on the market. As a result, many vendors continue to struggle to make a living, worrying about a citations and harassment from BSS officers on top of the struggle to feed their families and keep stable housing. If we continue to enforce and punish vendors who cannot obtain food compliant carts, the fewer there will be who will see any value in participating in the program at all and who will not engage in opportunities to participate in health and safety education. This motion will better promote overall public health and food safety in our city by redirecting our attention away from ineffective and harmful punitive enforcement and instead devoting our resources to opening doors for vendors to actually obtain the permit and the equipment needed for safe vending. Thank you. Thank you. Callers, press star nine to request to speak. Star nine. Caller ending in 1812, press star six to unmute yourself. Caller, are you Good afternoon. Back? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. What items would you like to speak on? I'd love to speak on item number seven, please. 
Okay, you have a minute. You can go ahead and start. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Rudy Espinoza. I serve as the Executive Director of Inclusive Action for the City, and I'm calling in support of item number seven. Uh, street vendors, as I'm sure you know, have been devastated by the pandemic. And when the city street vendor street vending permit program was established in January 2021, vendors were promised a moratorium on enforcement to allow them the opportunity to save money needed for a permit. They also needed this time so they could learn the complicated processes at the Department of Public Health. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, the city council moved to ban all unlicensed vendors immediately um, in March and April. That ban has not been lifted, and what we are asking for and what vendors need is this moratorium to be reinstated to give them an opportunity to, to participate in our economy. These are the most vulnerable entrepreneurs in our communities, and they deserve an opportunity, just like other businesses in our community, to participate and to make sure they have a shot to take care of their families as our economy recovers. Uh, I, I, I ask for your unanimous support for item number seven. Thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, callers press star nine to request to speak. Uh, caller ending in seven zero zero six, press star six to unmute yourself. Are you there? Yes. Is the item you'd like to speak on? Um, is is this the special or the regular? It's the regular. Okay, because the regular uh, had a a broken link. We, me and my friends gave it to Mr. Fowl. <laughs> But we'll go ahead and speak on all the items and general public comment. You have three minutes. You can start. Yes. And again, um, talking to Mr. Price, <laughs> if you go on the city's website, <laughs> you will not find the agenda. How unfortunate. Only for the special meeting for goats. The regular goat agenda is not there. What happened? Oh, well, um, they're holding the meeting anyway without proper notice of the regular meeting. Okay, but the special meeting was agenda. Yeah, the special meeting fine. So, again, um, okay, well, current price, see, like he used to run PDQ, he's going to put the city into bankruptcy. <laughs> so, uh, we'll go ahead into the general comment. <laughs> yeah, so, how many minutes do I get on my general? <laughs> You get one minute. Yes. So again, if you go to the city clerk's website and you click on the 330 regular, you get a bad link. <laughs> now, Mr. Fable, on the other hand, had the good link. But as you go, uh, my friend Mr. Spiller has the screenshots to prove you fucked it all up. <laughs> so you have to agendize the meeting within 72 hours of the Ralph M. Brown Act. He didn't do it. <laughs> In effect, he did something worse. Worse? Yes. The agenda Mr. Fobble did tried to combine the regular and special with the one agenda. <laughs> what a terrible thing. And Go Puppet tried to cure and correct it. He went to everybody. He went to Mike Fuhrer. He even went to Mike Bonin. Nobody could stop it. So again, enjoy your illegal meeting. I just hope nobody challenges this in court, but that would be a real goddamn shame, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, but again, um, you guys like illegality. Look at Stafford B, who apparently might have been caught with weapons at LAX later. <laughs> Check the story. Right, thank you for your comments. Oh, yeah. Caller ending in 2495, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. State the items you'd like to speak on. Uh, I'd like to speak on item 7 in general public comment, please. Okay, you have two minutes. You may go ahead and start. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm My name is Lyric Kelker, and I'm the Policy Director at Inclusive Action for the City and the Steering Committee member for the LA Street Vendor Campaign. Um, I'd like to thank Council Members Raman and Price for writing this motion and Council Member Sabia for seconding. I strongly support the moratorium on enforcement for the remainder of the emergency, emergency period in the six months following. Uh, vendors have fought for over 10 years for the right to be legal and formalized, and then finally on January 2nd, 2020, the first ever sidewalk vending permit was issued. Vendors were promised a six-month grace period, but that was cut short at the beginning of the pandemic. 
vendors are doing everything that they can to be business ready, and that includes getting their ITINs, their BTRCs, their state sellers permit, and as earlier noted, a food handler's permit for food safety. The county health permit, however, is extremely arduous to obtain because the requirements are meant for an operation closer to a food truck or brick and mortar business. To date, less than 2% of food vendors in the city of LA have gotten their city permits because of this opaque process. An enforcement moratorium will give time to refocus the approach for getting vendors what they need to formalize their businesses as they fought for, as well as give them the time that's necessary to ready their business for formalization as they were, were originally promised. Lastly, we, know, we now know that outdoor dining is an integral part of recovery and vendors are really the original alfresco eating option, but have been afforded almost none of the benefits their brick and mortar counterparts have, been, have received. So please give vendors what they were promised after over a decade of advocacy and decades longer of citations. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, that is uh, it for public comment. Thank you. We're gonna close public comment. I wanna thank everyone for their, uh, for their input. Uh, during this important part of our meeting. Uh, members, uh, if there's no objection, I'd like to put items one, two, three, uh, and six on consent. Seeing no objection, that will be the order. Thank you. Let's move on to item four, Mr. Clerk. Item number four. Economic and Workforce Development Department report relative to proposed request for proposals for Los Angeles business source operators. Okay, we know this is a very important uh, tool in the, in the toolbox, uh, literally and figuratively. Um, the uh, business source centers are sometimes the, the first and only contact that uh, many of our small, medium, and, and micro businesses uh, have uh, with the city. Uh, and so we, uh, we look forward to the presentation and to, and to seeing how we can make the uh, programs even more effective as we move forward. So without further ado. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, Jackie Rodriguez, Assistant Chief of the Economic Development Division of EWDD. I'm here welcome, to speak. Welcome, Jackie. Welcome, good afternoon. It's, it's a beautiful day today, actually. Um, I'm here to speak about the Business Source Center uh, system request for proposal transmittal. I'm trying to use as many as as few acronyms as possible. So hopefully I accomplish I accomplish that. The system was last procured in 2015 and established nine centers located throughout the city. Centers provide assistance to eligible for profit small businesses operating in the city of Los Angeles. Over the last two program years, the impact on the business community has included a total of 53 million in new business loans packaged and approved establishment of approximately 337 new businesses. Approximately 1,800 jobs were created or retained and over 1,300 uh, businesses were assisted during um, the COVID-19 related matters uh, during the current pandemic. When looking at the business or system, we wanted to design us uh, centers that can meet the needs of businesses throughout the city and serve as the business assistance delivery system. In preparation for the business, source re-procurement and to improve the efficiencies and service delivery. EWDD conducted surveys of businesses, met with current business operators, completed a cost benefit analysis and service area needs assessment. Based on that full funding, EWDD is proposing to fund nine centers at 550,000 uh, per center across the city. The current program provides an array of services and resources needed to support small businesses. The redesign system will require selected operators to continue to provide those services, but through a more individualized and focused delivery system to meet the unique needs of the businesses they assist. Business or centers uh, will be a key player in implementing economic recovery strategies for small businesses. They will provide resources to navigate uh, negative ongoing impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and develop a resiliency plan for any future economic shocks. The system will focus on starting, stabilizing, and expanding businesses within the city. It will provide increased services hours uh, per center, 
innovative technologies, virtual resources, increased language capacity based on the service, need, service area needs demographics. All centers will provide a core menu of services, which include general business services, such as entrepreneur services, business compliance uh, requirements, licensing permits, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Financial, financial services will include business finance courses, procurement and financial analysis, access to capital, loan packaging, direct and indirect lenders, income and cash flow management. Uh, finally, technology-related services, including uh, cybersecurity, website creation and optimization, and payment and financial solutions for small businesses. One of the major enhancements uh, through this business system under this proposed RFP is the utilization of centralized services to streamline the frequencies, the frequently unused um, services for economies of scale. Credit counseling and legal services are proposed to be uh, centralized and will be able to be accessed across the entire business or center system. We will also require the business or centers to provide leverage resources. This will encourage centers to expand their pool of resources and solidify partnerships. During COVID, the need for these centers that can pivot and offer more extensive services was made clear, as well as the need to provide more extensive services to small businesses and other enhancements offered through this redesign. The authority to release the RFP and select the business source operator is critical. The program will not uh, will continue to be a successful tool to provide business comprehensive and diversified services for job creation and job retention and business stabilization. Small businesses are the lifeblood of Los Angeles and the nation, and as such, they need to be supported. The business source program will fill an important need providing technical assistance and support to the business community of our center. Um, finally, I would like to note a, a small technical correction on the recommendations of the transmittal. It states that the initial contract would start September 1st. However, um, EWDD is requesting that the contract start October 1st. Uh, I apologize for that um, correction. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Appreciate uh... Uh, your report, uh, and we certainly appreciate the the needs assessment uh, that uh, was conducted as a part of this RFP. Uh, but I've got a couple of questions, uh, and, uh, and I think my colleagues might as well. Uh, if some of the geographic areas were identified as being highest need, uh, why are they getting the same level of service as all the other areas? Let me unmute myself. Uh, thank you. Uh, what determining the level of centers, level funding was assumed. If additional funding was made available, EDD can add either full sites or satellite sites that can be staffed um, full time and enable the businesses in these communities that are most in need to meet with somebody face to face and, and in their preferred language. So, so when is that decision made, whether or not the, uh, the center gets the additional resources? Uh, these centers are funded with CDBG funds. So at the time of the release of the comp plan budget, um, which I believe was just released, these, these processes were going concurrently. Um, so we had to assume level funding um, for now. I mean, the, the budget was just released on Friday, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, on your map, you've got four areas with the score above 30, all bordering on each other. Southwest, South, Pico Union, and the East. Wouldn't it make sense to add another center here uh, with the need being so high, or at least an additional funding or, or a satellite location? That would, that would be possible. Unfortunately, we are bound by the funding that we receive. Um, if we were to add a satellite service uh, satellite service center, I'm estimating, I'm estimating um, approximately like either 250 to 300,000, depending on the center. And this is just me estimating. Um, we can do a cost benefit analysis to actually give you the, the cost of it. But on a rough estimation, that's how much we would be for full time staff to be at the uh, satellite location. Mm -hmm. But as well, yeah, I think it is something we'd like to have some further consideration on, uh, you know, as, a, as an option. 
but la last question before my colleagues have a chance. Uh, why are we not looking to increase funding for services at these business resource centers? I mean, given the fact that we're coming out of a pandemic and the recession has forced many out of business, you know, it seems like we should be, you know, sprucing up these resources, not sort of leveling it off and sort of maintaining the status quo. That is an excellent question. Um, I believe I saw a couple of my colleagues un unmute themselves. Um, once again, I mean, the, the consolidated plan is what funds us. Um, if there were to be additional funding, then we would be more than happy to increase the services or increase the centers that are available. Um, that we can serve more, more businesses and at a greater um, centers across the city. Okay, thank you. Uh, colleagues, any, uh, any questions? Councilwoman Roman. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I had a couple more questions. I, I did want to drill down a little bit about the, I didn't quite follow your answer to council member Price's question about why, if you have determined that some areas have significantly greater need than others, why they're being given the same level of funding at all of those centers, that doesn't seem, uh, if there's a set amount of money uh, and we can allocate it in different ways, we may want to be allocating it so that more funding goes to those areas which have the greatest need. Is there a reason that you decided to equalize that funding across the nine different centers? Yes, so the center, uh, the model is based on a center, center-based system. So all the services are gonna be the same across the all centers. The only thing that's gonna be different is um, maybe the languages that are spoken. There are some areas that require um, Armenian or, or, or Farsi, um, others require other languages, uh, not just in English and Spanish. So that's the only difference that's gonna happen within the centers. But the funding was based, or the cost per center was based on services being um, equal across all centers. I would like to add that any, the centers are open, even though, regardless of where they're located, any business can access the services in any of their centers, whether they're closer to one because that's where their business is, or maybe that's where their home is, they can access any of the centers across the city. Right, um, I guess, yeah, I guess I just, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, council members. Uh, great to see you, I hope everyone's doing well. I'm Daisy Hernandez, I'm the Chief Grants Administrator for the Economic Development uh, Division for EWDD. And I just wanted to add to the comments that um, Jackie made, I just wanted to um, say that as we prepare this report to present to you, um, we were uh, doing under the presumption that uh, we would have level funding. Again, we cannot um, anticipate if there's going to be more money allocated. If there is more money allocated, of course, we might be able to do um, other services and other allocations and other considerations for the program. But uh, the whole report was on the basis that, that, the, that the system would be level funded. And that was a requirement of the funding that you're receiving? Oh, well, it's uh, it's not a requirement, but it's it's again based on just uh, on the consideration of of level funding, um, but it's not a requirement. Uh, okay, I guess I'm just a little. I'm sorry to keep pushing on this. I guess I'm just a little bit confused. Of the report was interesting and well thought out because you looked at areas of greatest need, um, and like Councilmember Price pointed out there was a cluster of neighborhoods that had incredible amounts of need. And so, you know, if you're like, there is a choice that you could make to devote significantly more resources to those areas. And that might be an option to consider when you're, um, you know, when you're, when you're doling out that funding, whether or not there's more funding provided by um, in the CDBG program. That is something that we can look into. Um, I had a couple of other questions. Um, I, you know, I know that this moment of need is really specific to some of the challenges around COVID. And I was wondering whether you could talk about 
some of the specific services that the BSCs are offering? Um, and is there anything that's specific to post-COVID recovery, like landlord, you know, rent negotiation or mediation on leases? Like there are really specific problems that people are having right now that I think right. that the BSCs could address. And I was wondering whether you could um, speak to whether the BSCs are planning to address any of that. Absolutely. So one of the things that we um, definitely are bringing into the centers, um, one is credit counseling. A lot of the smaller businesses, I'm talking the smaller businesses intermingle their personal finances and their business finances. They're one and the same. Um, so yes, we can teach them how to separate them, but the damage has already been done. So we're working with uh, credit counseling to help them not only um, increase their business credit, but also their personal credit. So if there's ever a chance for um, another recovery program or they want to expand their business, they have the ability to do that because their credit score will reflect that. Legal services is another component. It's one of our centralized services. Um, once again, lease negotiations, um, any wage disputes, those were, those were programs that were needed now and even before COVID, but even more now. Our moratorium on, on um, commercial evictions will be up soon. And they will have, I think, three to six months uh, to pay back any past due rents. They might not have that money. They might just be starting up. So how do they negotiate with their landlord? How can we offer that legal assistance to businesses? Um, technical assistance for websites. Once again, smaller mom and pop shops, uh, smaller businesses, and I shouldn't call them mom and pop, these smaller businesses need those services of like websites. How do you access money? How do you do transactions through websites and not just in person? So we wanna help those businesses grow that portion of their business and then expand it. I mean, why not think about international trade? Most of us during COVID have been shopping online irregardless of where they're located. You need a service, you shop for it. So our businesses need to be able to provide those services online and be able to ship to wherever it is that, they, that the, their products are needed. And yes, and just to um, add to what um, Jackie said, um, we are considering, there, there were a lot of lessons learned with COVID a lot of things that we may have anticipated others that we couldn't have anticipated but we are applying those lessons learned um, to incorporate these services into this rfp and uh, in the report within the report we explain about adding these legal services and and um, adding these um, services for to to support businesses to so they can become um, uh, businesses that, that do business online so and, and, and improve the technology skills of these business owners. So uh, we are considering all the lessons learned um, and incorporating them into this, this uh, new request for proposals. Um, that's great. Thank you. I appreciate the focus on the legal skills. The last, I just have one last question on the report, on the reporting of um, kind of your metrics for success. I loved the positive feedback that you got from the people who have used your services. And, you know, as you think about that question of access, I wanted to drill down on that a little bit. You know, I, I think it would be useful to know um, how successful the BSCs are, are actually in actually reaching businesses. Like you've gotten feedback from the businesses that you have reached, but how many businesses are out there that don't know about your services? and are, are not relying on them to get through a really difficult time. I think that they're, you know, that, that's a missing piece of the question of access and efficacy that I think could be useful to include um, in the report. Um, I also think that it would be useful. I saw some metrics of success that you had included in this, in this note, in this memo, in terms of the number of businesses created, the jobs created and retained, loan secured, I just wanted to get a little bit more context on how these figures compared to the program's original goals and targets, as well as how they compare to cities with other cities with similar programs, again, to make sure that we're getting the most out of these dollars and these centers. So I think if there's an opportunity to drill down a little bit on these pieces of information, um, I think those two would be really important to, um, uh, to elucidate. 
Uh, so thank you. That very good questions and comments. Um, just to give you an idea, um, uh, our program, the, the funding sources, the Community Development Block Grant (CDBG), and the requirements for that program is that we uh, create or retain one job for every thirty-five thousand dollars that we spend on the program. So based on the budget, uh, we really uh, are required to create or retain about 135 jobs. So we have far exceeded the requirement for the program. So that makes our, our, our business source system very successful. And this is in addition to all the um, services that we provide. So it's not just about creating jobs, which is really the funding source, that's what they require, but we go beyond that. We, uh, we provide the services, we provide the support in order to create those jobs. Great, and thank you for all your great work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Bob Blumenfeld, please. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Roman, you were going down the same road I was going to go down. I appreciate that on, on metrics. You know, how do we uh, how do we measure success? And it sounds like you, you've you've outlined a number of the ways. Are there any other uh, performance metrics that we should know about, particularly that are going to be different in this go round than last time? We're also going to measure um, profitability. And, and I'm trying to be I'm going to give you the broad range. Uh, definition um, and some of it will be more detailed in the actual RFP but what we've noticed is that um, businesses need to increase their profitability but there's not there might not be a direct correlation to jobs so Daisy mentioned that CDBG requires that we retain or create jobs but profitability whether they go from a 1% to a 5% or etc whatever it is or even a 1% to a 2% profitability that would stabilize the business. We want to make sure that we're capturing those metrics. What is the increase of profitability? That's one metrics that we were going to um, create. Customer satisfaction and outreach. So, uh, Councilwoman uh, Raman, you're you're right. I mean, how do we we know who we serve and how happy they are with the services, but we don't know who we're missing. So, how do we increase that outreach? How do we do more? Uh, direct outreach to our business communities um, with the the implementation of or the future implementation of the Jedi programs. Our business or centers will also be hand in hand with our Jedi program to outreach to those businesses to make sure that they are aware of the services that we are um, promoting. We would also like to utilize all of uh, Council's newsletters and e-blast to promote our services. Um, so that we are not a, not a secret and we're, um, we have a wide range of, of metrics. So those are the two metrics that we're going to um, increase in, in addition to loans uh, packaged and funded, job creation. So we're trying to measure how to get to success and how to get to job creation, which is ultimately our HUD goal. Our HUD goal. Um, that's what we have to do for HUD and for our funding sources. But there's steps along the way that will pave those, um, that actual outcome. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. And a couple of comments I just, in hearing my colleagues talk about the needs, I wanted to throw in there. When we think about needs, we also think, I need to think about the geography. And, um, you know, you mentioned that we want to have uh, access to jobs all over the city. Uh, right now, we only have three of these centers in the entire San Fernando Valley just three out of 15, when the valley is more than 40% of, of the population. The folks who, and there's only one in the West Valley, the entire West Valley uh, that serves serves my community. And, and that, that center has to serve 500,000 people compared to the other centers that are serving half that number of people. So it's important, you know, it's not as simple a question when we talk about the needs as, as uh, we all want us, uh, I, I certainly want us to be dealing with highest needs, but when we look at the needs, we need to look at the fact also that folks, businesses in the Valley are going to have to travel great distances to take advantage of this service. And I'm talking about folks who are very distant, you know, there are folks who are in great need in the San Fernando Valley. And, and I'm always standing up for the folks in Canoga Park and Reseda who get overlooked because they, they happen to live near other zip codes that are, are better off. And I don't want them to get forgotten in any any of the um, 
critical programs that we do that target high needs. But I, I just wanted to point that out about the geography as well, and that this needs equation is, is a little bit more, needs to be a little bit more, more nuanced, and it needs to take into consideration how far folks have to travel to get to a source center and how many people are, are, are uh, competing for that one source center. And, and having 40% of the city served by only three, per, three of the um, centers, you know, is, is a small percentage. I'm not saying, you know, we should be redistributing the way we're doing it, but I just want to point that out and, and point out that there, is a very, there are real high needs in the, in the San Fernando Valley and in the West Valley as well that we, we don't want to overlook uh, in this equation. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfeld. I, I agree with you. We want to make sure there is uh, equity, better equity, uh, throughout um, throughout the uh, the network. Um, Mr. Marquise Harris Dawson, I believe you had a your hand up, sir. Yes, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your questions. And uh, both council members, uh, Raman and uh, Blumenfeld, I appreciate your uh, comments. And, uh, you know, to the staff who presented this, this to us, I think, you know, this it's the equity uh, isn't easy. Uh, it isn't an easy question because it's a question that's new to the city. Um, we're just moving. We, we you, you know, in the long, long history of the city, it used to be that the people with the most got the most and everybody else got nothing. Then after the civil rights movement, we moved to equality where we gave everybody the same thing, which was an improvement over what we did before. And now we're trying to move to equity and really target things to where uh, they need to be. And we're right in the middle of that change. And, and it, so it's uneven and bumpy. And sometimes you run into situations uh, like this. Um, but, you know, I, I think I really appreciate the example you gave around language. You don't treat a place where people speak uh, a language other than English. You don't say, well, they all have English. So we're assuming everybody speaks English. You don't do that. You, you look at the particularities of the situation. And I think uh, in the case of resources, uh, it matters if you're, it, it, and, I, and I would continue to argue this forcefully, if you're in a business rich environment with high incomes very close to you, that's a qualitatively different situation than being in a business poor environment where there are low incomes all around you for miles and miles and miles and miles. Unfortunately, in this country, we tend to organize, um, we tend to organize class and race geographically. We just, that's just the way, uh, that's the world we're born into. Uh, so I, I, I think it's very important. I, you know, Mr. Chairman, I would join you in any uh, amendment or report back that you want to get, but I think we have to look hard at these uh, issues as well for another reason. Uh, and this is very hard to take coming from South LA. When you have something, and this has nothing to do with the staff, but it is just the way of the world, the way the world's organizing organized now. When there's a development agreement for a real estate project in a wealthy part of town, the benefits of that development agreement have to go to the geographic space that the development is in. So because we know investors pra actively practice apartheid, they don't invest as much in poor areas as they do in rich areas. It means that if you're in that area, no matter what your situation, you get the benefit of these agreements. If you're in a poor area, you don't. On the other side of the coin, the city of Los Angeles receives federal funding, philanthropic funding on the strength of the poverty in this city. In other words, if, I if you take South LA and East LA out, we don't get any CDBG money, not for the West side, not for Hollywood, not for the Valley, not for anywhere, because we just wouldn't, there wouldn't be enough poverty to merit the award that we get. Uh, and so just like there's a, that unevenness on one side of the equation, um, I, I think we have to take a real hard look at the other side of the equation. Again, notwithstanding, I certainly appreciate uh, what Mr. Blumenfield's saying about, you know, if I have to drive to the Valley for something, you might as well not be there in many cases because it's just inaccessible. So, so I get that and I appreciate that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we're getting awards because there are a lot of poor people, in my opinion, the awards ought to go disproportionately to the places where there are a lot of poor people, because uh, otherwise we're not having this discussion. So uh, with that, I, I'll um, yield back to you, Mr. Chair, but I, I join you in any report back or further investigation that you like, you'd like to see on this. 
First of all, members, thank you for your, for your robust and, uh, and thoughtful, thoughtful comments all the way around. Uh, you know, we, we keep having this discussion around uh, equity in our city increasingly. Uh, and I think it's a conversation that we, that we need to keep continue having. Uh, we can't just do business as usual. Uh, we just can't. So uh, I'm going to, uh, and again, I think like some, that we, we still need to be putting more resources into the hardest areas, or the hardest of neighborhoods that have been neglected. So with that, I'm gonna recommend that we continue this item and instruct EWDD to report back to this committee in 30 days with revised service plan areas, which take into account the needs assessment, including potential changes to funding and satellite locations, and mindful of the comments made by uh, members uh, Rahman, uh, Mark Reese, Harris Dawson, and uh, Van Blumenfeld. In the um, in the objection to that recommendation. Uh, Mr. Clerk, why don't we take a vote on it? Very good. Council Member Price? Aye. Council Member Krikorian? Council Member Bloomfield? Aye. There's a report back, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. In 30 days. Council Member Robin? Yes. Council Member Harris Dawson? Yes. Okay, thank you, members. Uh, and thank you, staff. Let's con you. continue this discussion. We are in it together, uh, and and we want to keep working it, keep working it out. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Clerk, what's next? Uh, that'd be item number five. Item five: Department of Convention and Tourism Development Report relative to rate adjustments for the Los Angeles Convention Center. Okay, the other day we uh, invited the committee, we talked about the unique role the Commission Center uh, is playing in, in our recovery. Um, we know it's a real impetus for tourism, uh, for the hospitality industry, uh, and, uh, and overall economic development. So let's hear from, uh, let's hear from our city family. I don't know who's with us today, Dom. Oh, there he is. Um, Thank you, Councilman. Uh, appreciate this opportunity to uh, present this um, uh, potential motion that would uh, help us become more competitive as we recover, as we recover uh, at the Convention Center. Uh, we need to do some adjustments to our pricing to make us uh, uh, in line with our, with our competition. I'm going to ask our Director of Policy and Research, Kim Nakashima, to uh, make a presentation and explain the uh, proposed motion. Good afternoon, council members, Kim Nakashima, Convention and Tourism Development for City of Los Angeles. Um, I will be going over some of the considerations that we took into account while developing these recommendations, as well as like the urgency of what's going on. And I will also be going over the recommendations themselves. So we approve um, the recommendation. As you're well aware, there's an ongoing moratorium on large gatherings and events. And so therefore the Los Angeles Convention Center hasn't had its typical business for approximately a year now. Um, we have maybe close to 150 events that were canceled. And so um, translating that, that would be equivalent to approximately 760 million in total economic impact that's lost for the region and that includes over 15 million in transient occupancy tax for the general fund, as well as over 36 million in total direct revenue to the Los Angeles Convention Center. And so these are proactive steps that we felt would help generate revenue for the city, as well as for the Convention Center, um, and also to prevent the loss of future business. Um, and so just a little bit more detail of what we're looking at here, um, the discounting policy for the convention center, the, the wider details of it are captured in the Los Angeles administrative code. And so these recommendations are to amend the admin code. Um, and we also have additional internal guidelines that are overseen by 
Doan, uh, the CTD Executive Director, as well as we report to our Board of Convention and Tourism Development Commissioners. And so some additional things that we were looking at, um, definitely the state of the industry. So for lodging, um, when the pandemic hit, there was definitely a decrease in hotel room night demand. Um, we're really at a fraction of where we would have been pre-pandemic for the fiscal year to date. Our average occupancy in City of Los Angeles hotels is around 41%, and pre-pandemic, that would have been closer to 80%. And so here you can see a chart that shows um, a forecast of the recovery for the lodging industry for the nation, and this was developed by STR and Tourism Economics. And so you can see the dark line, which is the hotel room night demand or hotel room night sold, they're anticipating that that will potentially be recovered to pre-pandemic levels by 2023. However, that's really driven by domestic travelers. Um, and so you really won't see the recovery of revenue per available room or rev par or average daily rate, otherwise known as ADR until further out. And the same goes with international travel. We probably won't see that recovered to pre-pandemic levels until 2024 or 2025 as well. And so part of what we're seeing here with this picture is that recovery is inevitable, but what we want to do is to bring tools that will help um, facilitate that recovery so that when it's safe to hold meetings, um, we will be ready and we will be a great partner and a destination to do so. And so this is just one of the pieces that informed our proposed timelines for these um, temporary uh, recommendations. And so this next chart shows the um, tangible effect of the pandemic on transient occupancy tax general fund receipts. Um, last fiscal year, we were really on track for a full decade of uh, consecutive year over year growth. However, um, the pandemic really ended up uh, resulting in a 20% year over year decrease. And then the current fiscal year to date, we are at a fraction of where we would have been pre pandemic. And so, encouraging citywide events to book at the convention center is really a great direct way to help boost room night um, demand and to help replenish this um, source of revenue for the city. And another tangible effect of the pandemic is definitely felt in the leisure and hospitality industry. As I'm sure you're aware, leisure and hospitality in Los Angeles County accounts for more than one out of every eight jobs in total non-farm employment in Los Angeles County. However, uh, due to the pandemic, um, leisure and hospitality accounts for more than one out of every three jobs lost. So leisure and hospitality really had a disproportionately large um, impact from the pandemic. And as you can see, there's still a long ways to go for recovery. Um, specifically in the accommodation subsector, they are currently close to 60% below where they were prior year, and that's as of January 2021. So uh, this is definitely a sector that could use some help and uh, they've been hanging on for a long time. And so once uh, we're allowed to have events by the state and by the county, then this will be just the setup for that. And so moving on, I'll get into the recommendations. Um, we developed these with our partners. So Convention Center is owned by the city and it's operated by ASM, which was formerly known as AEG. And so they book the local events, which are within a 12 month booking window, generally smaller events, um, but also still a very important source of revenue. And we also got feedback from our partners at the Los Angeles Tourism and Convention Board. And they're the ones that are responsible for booking the very large citywide events. Um, they have thousands of room nights that they generate. A lot of times they have an international component and they're just great for business and for really building up our economy and um, raising our status as a global destination. Um, and so we have four recommended changes for um, temporary emergency discounting provisions um, that we're envisioning that would be uh, to help us address the challenges that we're foreseeing as we go through the pandemic. Um, pretty much immediately when the pandemic um, came into effect, uh, a lot of clients expressed concern.
Hello, Kim. Kim, can you hear us? Oh, there you are. Sorry about that. I got disconnected, I think. Yes. Okay. And so the mechanisms where we would usually have um, our discounting, uh, it doesn't really get us to where we need to get in order to retain business. Um, and so we also have a couple of technical improvements to the administrative code that we're recommending today. Um, we kind of discovered these as we were re-examining um, re how the code works with um, how we do business at the convention center. And so I'll go over those at the end. And so jumping into the recommendations themselves, these would be for um, the for the city attorney to draft an ordinance in order to amend the administrative code. Um, and so the first one that I want to go over today is the rental discounts for above projected TOT. So I'm going to go over the current practice first. And then I'll talk about what the issues are with the current practice, the challenges that we've identified, and then what we're proposing will be um, our temporary emergency provision. And so currently for citywide clients, and these are events that are uh, generally very large and they meet certain requirements, they're eligible for discounts based off generated TOT. And the CTD executive director, Don Liu, reviews and then approves these discount requests. And so the issues that we're anticipating is that the citywide clients will be in pretty bad financial shape. And so they will perhaps um, not be able to afford paying the rent um, if they were to have a less discount, if they were eligible for a lesser discount and perhaps they would be a lesser discount because they would potentially be generating less TOT because of the pandemic and as we're going through the recovery. And we're also anticipating that all the other convention center destinations will be really competing for the same business. There's going to be a real hunger as we go through the recovery phase. And so we'll need to be competitive in order to even maintain our current market share. Um, and so our recommendation is that the CTD executive director have the temporary ability to approve rental discounts greater than projected TOT. And this will be for events hosted through calendar year 2024 and these events, we would also want them to have the opportunity to generate economic impact for the region, um, to bring other sources of revenue, um, and also to develop these future business relationships. The second provision that we're recommending for citywide clients is that uh, we waive the penalties for TOT shortfalls. And so currently, when a client is given a discount based off projected transient occupancy tax, if perhaps they did not generate as much TOT as they originally were projecting, um, there's an audit performed after the fact. And then if the client ended up short of the projected amount, then the client needs to pay the difference. Um, and so we are anticipating that actually a lot of clients have already given us feedback that they would not be able to um, take on the burden of a TOT shortfall and then perhaps to the likelihood of a shortfall would be even more uh, strong just because of the pandemic and reduced attendance. Um, and so uh, the, the uh, having to pay the penalty might make the difference between a citywide event, between even having their event at all, or even choosing another destination. And so our recommendation is that the CTD executive director have the temporary ability to waive the TOT shortfall penalty for citywide events hosted through December 2024. And the last provision for citywide events, um, we currently look at the qualifications of an event to see whether or not they are eligible for discounting practices as a citywide. And so currently an event must have at least 3000 hotel rooms uh, total with 1,500 rooms on peak and use at least three hotels. 
And so if we're assuming that a lot of citywide events will perhaps have less attendance and less exhibitors, and we're also seeing a large number of hybrid events where it's both combined with virtual as well as in-person in -person components, then just attendance and room nights will be down in general. However, we do believe that these events will come back and they will come back very strong eventually. And so we want them to stay with Los Angeles and keep using Los Angeles as their venue of choice. And so our proposed recommendation for this is to allow the CTD executive director the temporary ability to waive the citywide qualification requirements if certain specific conditions are met. So this would also be for events that are hosted during our proposed pandemic recovery time period. Um, we also are looking for just events that have recently qualified as a citywide event. So we are making it so it's not just an open door for just all events, but we do want them to have met some sort of like standard before the pandemic. Um, and then also we are looking for events that generate economic impact, other sources of revenue, and also with the potential for a strong business relationship going forward. And then our last temporary emergency provision is related to rental discounts for local events. As I mentioned before, these are the smaller events that are booked by the convention center within a 12 month booking window. Generally, they're smaller, but we do have some very large citywide events that um, generate a decent amount of revenue for the facility and perhaps some room nights as well. And so coming through the recovery, this will be also a very important piece of business to retain. And so we are proposing that the CTD executive director have the temporary ability to approve rental discounts greater than 35% for these local events. And this is also with the same timeline of through 2024. And uh, moving on to the permanent uh, technical improvements that we're recommending to the ad code. Um, the first one is related to equipment. Currently equipment is, uh, the discounting is linked to the same discounting provisions that are provided for local events and for citywide events. Um, however, this is administratively excessive and a little bit cumbersome. And the end result ends up being something that's not in line with how the industry standard is for the treatment of equipment and discounting. And so our recommendation is to remove the equipment from the existing discounting policies and then to break it off separately and to make it so that the CTD executive director have the ability to establish the schedule of rates for equipment. And the last permanent a recommendation that we are proposing another technical improvement is that the convention center currently has a lot of spaces that are used by clients. So like perhaps the plaza out in front, Gilbert Lindsay Plaza, or maybe the lobby areas. And right now, all of these other spaces aren't listed in the ad code. Um, however, um, city council needs to be the authority to grant the setting of rates um, for all spaces in city facilities and the ad code is currently silent on these um, other spaces. And so our recommendation is that the CTD executive director have the ability to establish a schedule of rates for special event and marketing spaces. And um, that is the end of my presentation and I am happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim, for your very complete and uh... Uh, exhaustive uh, review of the recommendations and we appreciate them. Uh, generally speaking, are these, uh, um, is this authority consistent with what we're seeing at uh, sort of our competing uh, venues around the country or are we charting some new territory giving uh, all this power and authority to uh, Mr. Liu? I would say that um... For one, we would like to be more competitive than the other destinations, but it is not uncommon to see other destinations that are really doing the deep discounting now in order to retain business. Um, and so for us, you know, it'll be a balance between uh, what what is really needed in order to retain business versus, um, you know, losing business to other convention centers. Um, and so this will help us be a partner with even our local hotels or local businesses and other venues um, 
they will see our flexibility as a city as being a good partner through these challenging times. Um, and so I would say it's in line with what's going on in the industry. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kikorian. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Nakashima for the report. Um, so generally with regard to the citywide events, um, the economic value of those events is, is quite clear. Um, but there's always this trade-off when we talk about uh, policies reducing revenues um, in order to spur economic activity. This is kind of a miniature version of the subvention agreements uh, that the council has from time to time uh, entered into to spur hotel development downtown. And um, I, I always look at that with a very, um, uh, I don't want to say suspicious eye, but a questioning eye as to whether the economic effect, the economic uh, stimulus effect merits the expenditure in lost revenues. So um, if, I could, I, if I could clarify that, um, Councilman Krikorian, it's, it's slightly different in that these are um, the, the discount that we're talking about is the it's not from the TOT side. So the TOT numbers would stay the same, but in, in current practice, we apply that dollar for dollar on a discount on the rent at the convention center. In other words, what AEG collects from the citywide event. So the general fund will remain unaffected by the TOT and the TOT will remain as it was and the discount it's really coming off of the rent that's coming to, to the um, convention center, and it's and it's direct. Not it's not a inflated economic impact. It doesn't have a, a an inf inflation factor or an economic impact factor. It's dollar for dollar on the convention center. So I I get all that, Mr. Liu, and I think you anticipated early the direction I was going in. What what I was going to ask, I, I get that the TOT is an impact. But what I was going to ask is when you take that rent decrease, uh, how is that addressed? How is that loss of revenue addressed? Is it, I, I heard, I think I heard you just say that it's not going to have a general fund impact under any circumstances. So I gather you're just absorbing that loss of, of revenue. That's how we currently do things. So in other words, if we had a, a huge mega citywide event, um, you know, say, 10,000 attendees, um, the entire convention center uh, uh, under contract, um, we would apply the entire uh, TOT that's generated from that event. So it could be upwards of six, $700,000. And the rent for the full convention center might be $500,000. We would apply that dollar for dollar and they would end up paying us virtually zero. We, we, we have a nominal $1,000 rent fee. So even pre-pandemic, that is the case. We absorb, we at the, I, I should say, the convention center as an entity absorbs that discount and all of the money plus goes to the general fund. How do we, how do we survive? And how, how does the convention center survive that kind of discounting? Um, mostly uh, through food and beverage revenue which in a case of, you know, in an event that size could be upwards. Um. Could also be in our parking revenues. We charge that does contribute to the convention center. And even okay. with those practices in place pre pandemic, where we discounted up to hundred percent, the convention center generated $30 million a year over expenses of 20 million a year. So they can, you, they can address my concerns. That discount policy. Thank you. I, I, I get it on that. That, uh, thank you. That goes squarely to, to my concern. Um, the, the other question I had is on the, uh, local events. Um, I, I, I was going to ask what is the, um, 
what's the the value in giving discounted rents uh, on local events. Uh, but I, I gather that the real reason for that is that these are usually ongoing relationships and this is more maintaining the relationship so that they don't leave so that in future years you have the the continued benefit of, of that rep. So yeah, and the local the local events are, are ones that you're familiar with, the travel show, the fit expo, the yeah. the smaller, the ones that don't generate room nights, but we we have an annual relationship with them. They come back every year. And and we know that in the next couple of years, it's going to take it some time to get back to uh, the pre-pandemic attendance levels that they had. So yeah. yes, it's it's really uh, maintaining that relationship and not losing them to Anaheim or Pasadena yeah. or Long Beach. Okay, because with those events, it's, it's my contention that those events are of benefit to the convention center uh, because they bring in revenue to the convention center. They aren't of much benefit at all uh, to the economy because money that's spent by participants there is money that's not spent someplace else in the local economy, so it's a wash. Um, but your point is well taken and we don't want to lose those customers. And so I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. I guess the, um, well, you know what, I'll, I'll ask my other questions uh, another time so as not to slow this meeting down. I have some some sort of macro questions on the direction of the convention industry generally in the post-pandemic era, uh, but I think that'll take us down a rabbit hole that we don't have time for right now. So we'll discuss that another time. Sounds like another, committee, time. Sounds like another committee meeting, um, Mr. Decorian. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, recommendations make sense to me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your, uh, for your questions and for your comments. Councilwoman Rahman. Um, I just had one question about the timeline of the recommendation. So it looks like, um, well, thank you so much for the, you know, the detailed report and um, really appreciated hearing from both of you. Um, I, you know, I really just wanted to ask about why the time frame included in the motion I believe it changes this enhanced discretionary authority period from to all the way till December 2024. Um, and, you know, I was just curious about why, you know, why that length of time was so long from this moment, especially given that it feels like travel is already increasing, vaccinations are, you know, vaccination progress has been fairly aggressive and you know, it. I, you know, I feel hopeful about convention travel coming back again. So I was just kind of curious about why we're we're pushing, um, making these changes for such a long period of time. That's a very good question. Thank you. Um, just to speak to it briefly, a lot of our clients would have that international component that we would be concerned that it'll take longer for them to come back. Um, and so that one chart that I had kind of in the middle of the presentation, which showed the trajectory of the lodging um, recovery, um, it would perhaps be until 2025 before we really are at pre-pandemic levels. And so this would give us the flexibility, but I think ideally, you know, as everything starts to feel more confident and our clients are in better financial shape, then perhaps we wouldn't really need these discounting practices as much anymore, or maybe it would taper off. And so um, we will be reviewing these every six months to make sure that we're really on the right track and that they're still necessary and achieving the um, intended goal. And um, the added bonus that I uh, didn't mention earlier is that with the proposed Los Angeles Convention Center, expansion and modernization project, this would kind of serve a dual purpose in which if we're under construction at some point during this time frame, these tools will also be very useful in order to keep clients in the building while we're going under construction and mitigating those impacts from construction. So um, it's a little bit of we'll wait and see how it plays out. Um, hopefully we won't need it as long and hopefully the expansion will happen during this time frame too. And so we can use these tools at that same time. One last comment in the chart that Kim shared, that was prepared by um, Tourism Economics, a firm that's a subsidiary of Oxford Economics. It's the um, economics firm that's used by most of the travel industry. And, and they've been 
they've been pretty consistent in the last few months to, to say that uh, it will take till 2024 for us to reach pre-pandemic levels on, on overall tourism, international travel, and conventions. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think it would, I think I'm very comfortable with the changes you're proposing. Um, I would love to get a report back uh, at the end of 2022-23, uh, fiscal year 2022-23, I think to see like where we are in that progress and to see whether we could walk back some of these changes earlier than we expected because of you know, greater than expected travel um, in those areas. So I, I don't know whether you'd be open to that, but that I, I would love to see that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we uh, I think we all would uh, support uh, a review uh, as we as we move forward. I know that's something uh, the convention center is always willing to provide. Mr. Uh, Mr. Blumenfeld, uh, any comments? And my my all the questions I had were. Uh, adeptly asked by my colleagues. Okay, Mr. Harris Dawson, did you have the same luck? <laughs> yes. We're uh, uh, Paul Paul Kokorian is burning it up uh, on the eve of his birthday. <laughs> when is the birthday, Paul? Tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> we were trying to keep that a national secret, but uh, thank you. Uh, hey, yes. time. Well, no, don't worry. Your, sa your secrets are safe with us. Thank you. Thank um, you. I appreciate any it. other comments, members, on uh, on our convention center? I want to thank uh, Mr. Liu and uh, Takashima. Uh, members, unless there's an objection, I'm going to move that we approve the report recommendations as uh, as presented. And uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lind, why don't we take a vote on that? Uh, yes. Two questions, Councilman Price. If we wanted to report back at the end of uh, 20, uh, year 2022-23, would we need to include that as a change in this, or is that a request that would have to come separately? Uh, I think we'd incorporate that into the recommendations. OK, great. Friendly, uh, friendly recommendation for the recommendation. If that's all right with you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's have a vote, uh, Council Mr. Lid. Councilmember Price. Aye. Councilmember Krikorian. Sorry. Aye. Uh, Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Uh, Councilmember Robin. Yes. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Very good. Approved as amended. Okay. Thank you, uh, members. Next Thank item. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Item number seven, amended motion, Raman Price Sadio, relative to reestablishing the moratorium on enforcing and issuing citations for vending without a valid license or permit for the duration of the COVID-19 state of emergency and for six months thereafter. Okay, great. First of all, I want to thank, uh, thank those who called in. Uh, some of you know I've been working um, on this uh, sidewalk the bending program uh, since my first year here back in 2013 uh, with, uh, with several of you. Uh, but I think there may have been some confusion in regards to this motion before us today. Uh, this motion is not going to put a moratorium on all bending enforcement. Vendors will still need to comply with city rules and regulations as well as ADA law and COVID-19 protocols. What this motion does say is that uh, we, the city, will not be fining vendors simply for not having a valid permit. Given the impacts that the pandemic uh, has had on this community and, and the fact that the county has still not revised its own code or cart requirements for vendors, it's been extremely difficult for food vendors to obtain the necessary permits. And that's why uh, we're talking specifically, that's what we're talking about specifically today. Uh, is uh, a, a, a moratorium uh, on that activity. I have a couple of questions, uh, and then uh, we'll turn it over to uh, to my colleagues. Um, but street to streets, LA. You've been uh, the lead 
implementing department for sidewalk bending. Can you provide the committee with an update on the program and talk a little bit about the impact that the pandemic has had on, on your operations? Speech LA, are you with us? Good afternoon, Councilman Price. This is Gary Harris on behalf of Streets LA. Hello, oh, uh, Mr. Harris. Good you, sir. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we continued our program of outreach and education. We primarily focused on trying to assist the vendors as opposed to uh, hardcore compliance. Uh, during this time, we've made over 130,000 contacts with both businesses and street vendors about the COVID program, and yet we've written uh, less than 700 citations in the same program, uh, period. So you can see we do much more outreach, much more education than we do actual citing of individuals. Um, we too concur that due to the pandemic, this would not be a time to cite folks simply for just not having a permit. And uh, we will continue not to do so in accord with this motion. However, what we are doing uh, primarily is trying to help people educating them on how to go about navigating the system. Uh, mm -hmm. As you mentioned, a lot of the problems that we we deal with when we face vendors that they've told us is the difficulties that they're having in obtaining permits, particularly food vending permits because of county regulations. So we have been working and having regular meetings with the county of Los Angeles along with the vending advocates. And we have been trying to look for a path forward uh, to assist them in obtaining uh, cart plans that the county would accept as some type of general plan to make it easier for vendors because the, the carts available now are quite expensive and many of them are probably too large for what we really would want out on, on the sidewalk. So we're working with the county and hopefully with the advocates to try to come up with a solution. But the primary approval for this would have to come from the county of Los Angeles. It's really outside of our hands, but we do want to work with the advocates and try to assist in any way we can to help them in navigating the system along with the county. And I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have. What's been the practice on the streets uh, regarding enforcement? We know that's always a big issue. Uh, how did the previous council action of March 17, 2020 impact your enforcement activities? Well, our protocol that we've continued to follow uh, even after the previous motion, our protocol is to do uh, verbal warnings to folks when we first meet them. So we get out there and we tell them what the issue is. We share uh, materials with them that explain the, in with pictures, the whole thing about the protocols for where vendors can locate on the sidewalk, where it's prohibited to locate. Um, we but, but no ticket, no infraction, no. We 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 only as I said, we've only written six hundred and twenty, and those are in the most egregious cases where we have uh, repeat violators who continue the same practices over and over. Particularly things like blocking areas that would create an ADA uh, compliance problem. Council members, uh, would it be okay if I um, added yes. to Gary's comments? This is yes, Martin Schlageter. Yes, uh, hi, thank you, Martin Schlageter, and um, I'm the director of external relations uh, with Streets LA, and uh, uh, work closely with Gary's uh, special unit on on sidewalk vending on this program. And I just wanted to mention two aspects I think that relate to your question. That one, we maintain a regular communication. Uh, of a stakeholder meeting that currently operates monthly, but as we we started into the whole pandemic, we were having it more frequently. So everybody was aware of the uh, of what rules were getting applied. Um, so we do have a regular stakeholder meeting every month to try to make sure that our approach and vendor input is um, is shared, and that includes our agency partners, and we're bringing the county into that process as well. Um, and we recognize, you know, that COVID had disrupted the marketplace. Uh, so, so that's now uh, starting to normalize. Hopefully, certainly, folks are allowed to be out vending. The marketplace is open again, but it's still a, a diminished space until um, until you know, as everything as uh, our economy opens back up. 
but for that reason um, and under your direction, Mr. Chairman, and the council as a whole, the uh, continued reduced fee of the of the permit itself has been in place until this coming uh, 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 next fiscal year, July 1st. So there's been a whole series of, you know, uh, uh, communications and attempts to help the vendor community through this process and still work with our, our investigators and on the, and, and toward the purpose of having compliance with the rules and regulations that the, that the council has set up. Um, and I just wanted to chime in because our external relations and our stakeholder group is working very closely with the investigators. So um, it is intended to be a partnership of education and collaboration as well as compliance. That's the kind of collaboration we want to, uh, to see uh, within, uh, within the department. Let me ask you this, uh, does the city confiscate vendor carts or has that only been the county confiscating? That has only been the county of Los Angeles. We do not confiscate carts or enforce the health code generally. Uh, we stick to enforcing the city's rules and regulations. But confiscations are totally done by the county of Los Angeles. And in that regard, what's the, the largest, the biggest barrier for food vendors? Uh, to obtain a permit? What's the obstacle they face most frequently? Uh, the, the biggest obstacle is obtaining a permit from the a health permit right now from the County of Los Angeles. Um, as, as mentioned by some of the callers, these uh, requirements seem to apply more to larger businesses or food trucks and weren't really designed for sidewalk vending. And so that's been as, as uh, Mr. mentioned one of the reasons that we've worked closely with the vending advocates and hold those regular meetings working with the county in attempts to hopefully modify some of these regulations so that they would be more applicable to vendors and more easy for them to navigate. Great. Well, we appreciate uh, the efforts of both of you in this regard. We know this is a, uh, a touchy area, but it's an important area and one that we hope to uh, really shine more light on. Uh, as, as we as we work with uh, uh, these set of entrepreneurs who are trying to provide services. Uh, members, any questions? Uh, Mr. Krikorian, followed by Mr. Uh, Blumenfeld. Mr. Sorry. Krikorian? Yeah. Yes, sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I was muted. Um, so it seems like from what I just heard, uh, we're, the city is not currently citing uh, for lack of permits. Uh, the city is currently citing for egregious misconduct um, and uh, refusal to comply with um, you know, non-permit uh, requirements. Um, so, and what I'm also hearing is that those, and you're right, Mr. Chairman, you, you have labored uh, more than probably anyone else to try to find the right policy that balances, um, you know, bringing people into, uh, you know, a legal regulated framework um, and, and providing a, a sense of regulations that works. So it sounds like the one, the folks who are trying to operate the right way um, are being faced with all sorts of obstacles, primarily at the county, uh, not at the city, um, and some practical obstacles to to getting their um, their permits. I'm not seeing what that has to do with COVID. Um, it, it, we worked, the chairman worked for eight years on trying to develop this set of regulations and a, a licensing scenario uh, as did the rest of the council, um, that made sense, that struck a balance that allowed a, a path to um, a, a legal uh, uh, legality for these, these small business people um, that was based on a whole series of assumptions that the council wrestled over literally for years. Um, 
And it seems now in practice that a lot of those regulations are harder than we thought uh, to implement because of other government entities. And the city is working to try to work that out with the county and with others in order to assist the vendors. So why, what problem are we trying to solve then with a COVID related moratorium? I mean, wouldn't the better course be let's continue to try to work with the county, work these things out and get people licensed as soon as we can? Yeah, if, if I might, um, uh, Mr. Kokorian, uh, I think your your comment is well taken. And, and to the point of the motion in front of us, um, you know, at this time last year, uh, you know, the council acted um, with you know, the great uncertainty that we've lived with for so long here as the pandemic was starting to hit and wanting to be clear about in, uh, ensuring that uh, there wasn't dangerous, you know, transmission through activity on the sidewalk. And obviously since that time, we're knock on wood coming out of, you know, and into a different situation here, but also have learned a lot about how we can live you know, within the pandemic and, and keep distance and wear masks. And so as a result, during this time, you know, our investigators, while they're out, um, uh, you know, encouraging voluntary compliance have been bringing a lot of COVID related information and face masks and, you know, it, enforcing where, where folks are non-compliant with COVID rules to protect public health. So there has been a, there was a place for council's action at this point, And I think you know, there's, um, it, it's appropriate as you're considering here today to, to adapt that to what is a, you know, a, a slightly, a, a real difference on the street here um, to ensure that we're still providing that uh, open arms for vendors to come into the program, uh, but not but not operating out of uh, you know a, a drastic response to to the pandemic. Sorry, could I also just uh, provide one note, which is that the initially when Councilmember Price, um, when the regulations that you set up um, initially and and the licensing process was put in place, there was a grace period, a moratorium on the fines that were included in that or the citations that would be included in that, um, that was put into place in that licensing program. Uh, and that moratorium or that, um, um, that grace period was ended because of COVID, because of the fear of uh, con uh, people congregating outdoors. So that happened last mid-March of last year in council. Well, and so thanks, this would be thanks. reinstating that moratorium so that vendors can now go through that process of licensing, getting licenses. So thank you, Ms. Rahman. Maybe that gets to the heart of my question because uh, uh, that's not actually what my understanding was of what happened. Um, the grace period was intended to allow vendors time to come into compliance with their county health permits. That was why there was, that's my recollection of why there was a, a grace period. And it, I haven't heard anything to indicate that that process was slowed down um, it, it, because of COVID. It was slowed down because the regulations were not appropriate to these businesses. The existing county regulations were not appropriate. So it might be something that, um, uh, should have been finished already, or it might be something that we might want to extend until such time as the county's regulations change with or without COVID. You see what I, I mean? That the, yeah, the, I'm, the I'm pandemic okay. is, I mean, a, the, is a the, secondary the, issue. It's, yeah, it, the change it's, in the regular, the change in the moratorium was related to COVID though. The change in the enforcement or yeah, the change in the enforcement of the, of the, of the licensing process was made in response to COVID. Well, let me just ask that of staff because maybe I'm not clear on this. Did 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 we 
the action that we took in March of 2020 was to temporarily suspend street vending, period, wasn't it? Um, let me see if I can provide some clarity. So the action uh, of March of last year was to strictly enforce the health code and against unpermitted food vending. Um, and so, yes, that that was different than the uh, the grace period that we had established to try to encourage people to go through the process of getting their permits, whatever that permit might have been, health permit, or even just the city permit. Because then, and so there was a there was a um, an interest from the council at that time to say hold on, to strictly protect against any activity that might transmit uh, COVID, then no, uh, no uh, food vending activity would be allowed and we would be asked to, to enforce the uh, much more strictly. At this point, we have gone through the disruption of the marketplace, attempts to facilitate uh, ways in which the vendors can come back into the permitting process, knowing that the marketplace is open. So for a while, there wasn't a lot of um, drive for them to to come get a permit because they weren't, you know, weren't sure when they were going to be able to vend again. Right. Okay. Now that right. that's open, we want to make sure that this, and you want to make sure, but we're in agreement that this grace period type of approach not dinging people just because they don't have a permit and allowing this reduced permit fee through to the end of this fiscal year is at least how it's set up at this point. Your direction today, you know, would be to, uh, you know, to could be adjusted, but would still be taking that approach on, on the permit level, um, you know, uh, uh, the permit focus of whether there's citations for permits or not. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfeld. Thank you. Uh, you know, first let me say, I, I certainly, I want us to do everything we can to support our, uh, all of our businesses to get out of this, uh, you know, COVID recession and especially our, our most vulnerable businesses like our street vendors to do things to, that we can to support them. Uh, I had a question in terms of the practicality of this. You mentioned at the moment, we're sort of we're in a in a grace period of source because we're not really enforcing. You said only six hundred and thirty out of uh, one hundred and thirty thousand connections, which is less than half of a percent. What does it mean in terms of if this it becomes law, um, this moratorium? How does that change? So, let, for example, the six hundred and twenty repeat violators that you mentioned out of the one hundred and thirty thousand. Does this mean that you would not you would not have any tools to deal with those 620 folks, or do you have existing tools to to deal with that? How would how would those how would those people that you have contacted over the last year uh, how would that have been different if we had the moratorium in effect? It, it would it would have very minimal impact because we're talking about a number of other violations uh, that we're going to be primarily looking at, not the fact that you don't have to permit. But the fact that you're improperly set up on the sidewalk or your your sidewalk set up creates an ADA violation or you're not following some other regulatory uh, rule that's established by the Board of Public Works. So we still have all those things at our disposal under Section 4213 of the LAMC. We just would not use one specific subsection, and that is the one that says, you know, you must have a permit to vent. So does that mean this is more symbolic than practical? I mean, what, what is the practical impact of this? Uh, well, it helps those vendors out there who are still trying to obtain their permits because of all the issues that, I mean, the county has been slow at approving permits also because of the pandemic. So it helps those folks who are in the process of trying to get what they need to get a permit to come into compliance without being deemed for that. Because if they do get a citation for that, it could damage your status to become a permitted vendor because but, that but you're saying that they're not they're not getting citations now anyway right not for not having a permit that that is our current practice this uh, i guess memorializes what we're doing 
and clarifies so, for the vendors what what the previous action had indicated would be would be different. So kind of the the direction from council at this point has been somewhat somewhat different, but we've still been trying to adapt this for our for our yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not actual seeing, implementation. I'm not, I'm not seeing the practical impact. It sounds like there's not a practical impact that it's the, that it's the current policy and that's would be continued. It would just be memorialized a little bit more clearly. Is that fair? I mean, and it would have a date on it. Okay. And then, um, so we have, we have the other tools and I, I guess the other question is in terms of the non, you know, if we're, trying to encourage people to spend $300 on a permit. Um, what are we, uh, what are we doing to encourage that those folks if we're, you know, and I'm not saying we should be enforcing the permits, but how, you know, what's the, the flip side of this is if the longer that there is no other consequence to some extent, then there's no incentive either for someone to get a permit kind of goes back to, you know, when we were originally looking at this, I raised the question several times, why do we even bother with a permit? What, are, what does the permit actually give someone? Um, you know, it, it, we have rules and regulations about where you can be and where you can't be. We have the health department deciding whether, you, what, you know, health wise. Uh, I'm not sure what the value is of our permit. Maybe you could help me understand that. So let me give a starting point and then um, Gary, feel free to chime in. So um, I, I think the idea of a grace period is that it's not forever. Uh, and so um, at some point, the consumer, you know, the vision is that a consumer has an understanding. This is somebody who's legally permitted to operate. And that may give the customer some additional um, sense of security. But obviously, it's still a marketplace in transition at this point. The other thing is that by coming into the permitting system, we have already been able to share information with those permitting vendors and opportunities. So for example, when, um, when small uh, grants were available to help uh, provide relief uh, through small business grants were available to help provide relief due to COVID impact, we were able to communicate that to all of our permitted vendors and um, and direct them actually to the business source centers to try to get them to apply, you know, to enable them to apply for that relief funding. I know we also have an alfresco program and where there's opportunities within certain aspects of that alfresco program for a vendor to participate, we can communicate with those permitted food vendors to participate in that. So the vision is that this is enabling the marketplace and those permitted vendors who've wanted to operate legally and sort of build their history of uh, legal entrepreneurship that you know, we're helping also uh, create a, a space for communication and opportunity and resources for them as well. Right. No, and, 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 I, and I get that, it gives them a sense of, you know, after all these years of not being legal, uh, you know, to have something and say, hey, I am legal, I'm here, and, and that's valuable. And I, I mean, I supported it, even though I raised these questions when it when it came up, I supported it because I, I, I see that. And, and also at some point, I think will be, will the permit may apply to an actual location when you have, uh, you know, multiple vendors competing for a location, we need to find an equitable way to distribute those. And that's going to be where the permit ultimately comes down. From the consumer perspective, as you mentioned, people feel more secure because a vendor has a permit. Um, although currently the the security if the security has to do with food safety it's it's not really um the permit's not really adding to that unless now i heard you talk about the difference between a county health permit and a food handler's permit is that a difference and are the are our current vendors getting a uh, food handler permit and what's the difference so um there's a food handling permit that I believe vendors have to have, but also you have to get your cart permitted, you know, and there's a variety of regulations that go along with the permitting of a cart. And it's distinct about what kind of, you know, types of food you're vending, 
And then there's also where you store that cart and where the food is prepared if it's not prepared on the cart. So there's a, a, a pretty intricate and um, challenging space in addition to being, you know, uh, to getting your own food handling permit, which I believe uh, uh, vendors have to go through as well. Our uh, checkbox when folks are coming through to get a city permit is simply whether they've met the county's um, you know requirements and so we don't we don't second guess whatever is in someone's health permit we just affirm that they've gone through the county's process but because that is a laborious process we have fewer permitted food vendors than um, you know then then obviously you know the market would hold yeah, no, I mean, to me, it's 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 crazy how few of our vendors have gotten the county permit. It's actually, I mean, it's unconscionable that the, the county needs, and we need to figure out, maybe part of this, we get a report back about what we can do to light a fire under the county, because that is the choke point here that is, uh, it's not right, because, and I guess I also wonder, is there a legal liability that we take on when we are, if we were to issue a permit to somebody uh, who does not have the health, the food handler license certificate or the county health permit, uh, and then somebody, God forbid, gets sick from the food, are we liable as a city, even though it's the county who's responsible for that? Because we've now put our city seal on their, on their cart, on their, on their operation. Uh, I think we'd want to defer to the city attorney in answering that question, but I know one portion of the of the view of that here in um, in Streets LA is we wouldn't want to uh, you know give a city permit for someone to vend, vend food if they didn't have their county health permit because that would give a false signal to them that they could go do that when actually the county could then turn around and and enforce against them. So right. well, we, would, and, we feel like we'd be setting them up. But what our liability is, I feel like, and, you know, and, that's and, really a question for city attorney. The same, and we're not dealing exactly with that question because we're still requiring people to get a permit. We're just not enforcing it if they don't get it. But I wonder, and maybe the city attorney can answer this, does that not give us some of that same liability? Because it's one thing when we have an unwritten policy that is being, uh, which, we, which is where we have this sort of grace period and we're not enforcing it. It's another thing if we have a written policy saying, you know, and we vote on it and say, we are not, we're gonna extend this beyond the year and a half now. And, 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 you know, does that give us more liability? Because now we're officially saying it's okay to vend without uh, county health permits. And so what happens, does that, increase our liability. And, and I'm asking these questions not because I'm trying to get us to crack down. I don't want, I really want to support our vendors. I, I just, I want to understand, I want the city to be protected. I want the county to get off the dime and give these uh, permits. Uh, but I'm, I'm also, I'm, I'm, especially since what I'm hearing is that what we're doing here is not, has no practical effect. It's more symbolic and we want to be supportive. Um, I want to understand if we're if we're setting ourselves up for any liability or what what the story is, and maybe the city attorney can address that. Do we have a city attorney on the line who can address that? Yes. City attorney. Looks like we don't have the benefit of uh, the city attorney's comment at this time, Bob. All right, well, I mean, if, if anyone, you know, Martin or anyone from Streets LA or Gary, you know, have any insight into this as well, maybe not the liability question, but what what are we taking on? Is, you know, you said that it sends the wrong signal if we license somebody without the health permit. Um, what does it mean if we officially say we're not going to uh, you know, we're not we're not going to in, in enforce the requirement to get a permit. And, and what what then does that secondarily, what does that mean for the value of this permit? What is the value of the permit, you know, during this time frame? How do we actually get why is anybody going to spend 300 bucks uh, at this point to get a permit? 
I know I'm asking like three or four different questions rolled up into one, but. Well, I, I again, I don't want to step on Gary's toes. He leads the whole program here, but um, I think if this were envisioned as, uh, a, you know, uh, an unchangeable edict, then perhaps that, you know, would be, um, would be a heavier concern. If this is something that we know we can keep tabs on the program and how it's growing and try to adjust to it as, uh, as it gets uh, its legs under it a little more, then, then perhaps, uh, you know, that's worth a review. Um, I do think that, you know, one of the um, important aspects of protecting vendors who want to be operating legally is, is ensuring this legal uh, level playing field among vendors so that everybody is intended, you know, ultimately is expected to operate um, within the same program rules. We've seen previous pilots of vending falter under that situation and the undercutting that can happen by illegal activity, un, uh, unpermitted activity. But I do think that, you know, the city has been very clear about the expectations of a program. We have a, a very uh, active uh, team that's out there uh, doing compliance and education and, and communicating that there is an expectation the city has. If it were the 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 sense that that would that no enforcement were ever possible then i think there is a you know your point is uh is uh, well taken um but i think we're still at the in this sort of emerging stage delayed in the growth of the program due to the pandemic and and the disruption of the marketplace so i think we're still early enough that I mean, we I, can I, confront I, this adaptation and, and evolution later I might go an extra step during the time period when we're not enforcing, we probably shouldn't be charging anything for the permit. You know, how do we expect people, you know, we want to have a level playing field, but we're undercutting the very vendors that are, that are, that are obeying the rules. They have to spend, a, you know, 300 bucks is a lot of money to somebody who's, who's starting out in a vending business. And we're asking them to take that on when the person who's vending right next to them may be flouting it intentionally, maybe not, but, uh, and not paying that money. And they're, they're, you know, we've just put the one who's paying the money on a dis, you know, to a disadvantage because the one who's not saying, why, why should I pay? I've got a year after the pandemic or, or six months, whatever we said, um, you know, and, and when the pandemic is officially over, which could be in two years from now, who knows? when we actually undo the state of emergency, uh, you know, even when we get vaccinated, it's gonna be a while before we end. So, so I don't know why, I don't know how we can ask vendors to pay money for a permit when the vendor next to them doesn't have to and gets away with it. I, I don't know. I, maybe that's not, maybe I'm gone too far afield of the question in front of us, but- I, I just I, think Street LA has to, take your question as a rhetorical one and let the, we're going to follow the guidance of the committee and the council on that. All right. Um, I, I, I've got more questions, but I'm going to, I'll, I'll stop there, Mr. Chair. And I, I mean, I want to take your lead. You've been working on this. Thank you. I, yeah. We, we're going to have a, a recommendation uh, at the, uh, at, at the end, but I wanted to make sure everyone had a chance to get their questions out for some, it's kind of clear as mud, but <laughs> we're but we're still trying to work through it. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Raman, did you uh, have yeah, another comment? Yeah, I just had a, yeah, a couple of very quick questions. How many total um, permits have now been is issued through this program? There are a little over 1,400. I don't have the exact number. For Not just for food vendors, though, for vendors as a whole? Ven vendors all, all together, yes. OK. Um, and has that? number been growing steadily throughout the period of the pandemic? Yes, it has. Okay. Um, you know, I think for me, um, I think there's a couple of reasons why this is uh, important. I think 
even if you are not enforcing permits, I think when you have that kind of um, discretion on the part of uh, enforcement, I think that it, in my experience, when I've worked, for example, in, when I worked in India with street vendors there, um, that discretion on the part of enforcers Councilwoman, are you with us? Councilwoman Raman? Hello. Oh, you're back. Yeah, it's saying my internet connection is unstable. Sorry. This happens every day around this time. You're not, you're not alone. <laughs> you were mentioning you know, your experience in India. Oh, yeah, I, I was just saying that I think when it's not clear whether enforcement is happening or not, and when it's left to someone's discretion, I think A, it can create an uneven playing field, yes, and B, I think those are moments where more vulnerable residents are subject to harassment. And I think that's something that we would want to avoid and create in, in establishing a fair system. The other thing is that I think for us as a city, if, if we say we're going to be starting to enforce the system in X number of months or X period of time, that puts a fire, that lets a fire in our bellies to move forward and actually negotiate more strongly with the county to make sure that this permitting system is really functioning well for us. And I think that that's important. I think we, we don't have that, you know, I haven't seen, I know there's been a pandemic in the middle. So it's, I think the County Department of Public Health has been rightly focused on other issues. Um, but I do think it's important to make sure that we have some hard deadlines on how we're going to get this into a system that really works. And, you know, one thing I'm very cognizant of is that this licensing system is something that street vendor associations and street vendors themselves have fought for for a long time. And so I think I want to make sure that we are we are fighting for a, a working system alongside them as well. Um, and so I feel like this is this is important to, for us to be focusing on and making sure that we have some clarity on on the deadlines for when we're going to be taking action and how we're going to be pushing our county partners to do what they need to do uh, to make this really work. Okay, I I, I agree totally, uh, Councilwoman, and it's, there needs to be a lot more clarity. I think we need to get much different level of cooperation from our county. Uh, compatriots, and that just has not has not occurred. Uh, but I'd like to offer the uh, following amendment to the motion of that we rescind the council action of March 17, 2020, and instruct Streets LA to continue to use an education-based approach to compliance with the rules and regulations of the sidewalk and park bending program, and to issue penalty free notices of violations specific to bending without a permit. Um, I'll entertain a, a second on that motion. Second it. Second. Uh, a, a question about it? Okay, yes. Is that In discussion? Yeah, thank you. No, and, and I'm happy to second it or, or support it, but the, the does that, are you linking it, are you putting a time frame on this? I didn't quite, is that, does that, does your motion uh, have a sunset or, or, or is it uh, linked to a certain number of months or how, how does that work? Okay, we're going to ask Rita Lee to include that in the report back. Okay. That's, if that's okay. No, that, that, that's, that sounds great. I mean, I, I guess I would say, given what Ms. Rome was saying and everyone about the clarity, I think that the, the more clear we can be about about it, the better. So, you know, to have, but I'm happy to have that in the report back, to have it to say this is this is the policy until this date. Right. So that there is there is something. Some clarity. Right. Fresh clarity and some, some pressure to put on the county. Mr. Kikorian. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wasn't sure if I heard it exactly, but was it your intention when you, the rescission part, did you say that we would rescind the March 2020 uh, 
Rule 23 motion that the council enacted? Yes, the March, uh, March 17, 2020. So the, the concern that I have about that is that that motion provided um, affirmatively for enforcement of any and all health codes regarding safe handling um, uh, and, and other things, uh, instructing, you know, the LAPD and Bureau of Street Services uh, to work with county public health to establish protocols to enforce the health code and a number of other things. Um, and, and I would not be supportive of relaxing our enforcement of anything relating to the health code. Um, the, the point of this motion, I thought, was, you know, to help protect people who haven't gotten their permits. Um, but if it's intended to deregulate uh, the system with regard to um, enforcement of the health codes, I would not be supportive of that. So I'm not, I, I, I would just, I don't think that we need to rescind those um, previous actions of the council in order to achieve the um, objective of not enforcing simply for lack of uh, permit, even though I do share a concern even on that, because for the points that Mr. Blumenfield raised, the 1,400 people who have permits, you know, are really, you know, being taken advantage of um, by playing by the rules and then having people who um, maybe don't ever intend to have a permit or ever play by the rules competing with them. And, well, and not I think, I think the, previous, the previous rules, though, required Streets LA to enforce, didn't it? That was all. Well, that's what I, 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 I'm just looking at the motion from back in 2020, and it says, I move that LAPD and Bureau of Street Services be authorized to enforce any and all health codes regarding the safe handling and sale of food in the public right of way. Um, and it sounds like what Street Service has been doing is in the egregious cases where they have cited, it's, it's actually relating to those sorts of things that we authorized them to do back in March. It, and l unless they have independent authority to, to do that enforcement without our motion, in which case it doesn't matter, the motion is just redundant, but that would, maybe I should just ask, ask that as a question, if I could, as street services, does, how would that affect your ability to enforce what you're currently enforcing on issues unrelating to the status of permitting? if we were to rescind the previous motion? Uh, I don't believe it would have a significant impact. We're authorized under the municipal code to uh, enforce okay. basically anything under public works jurisdiction. Okay, so so the, effectively what we previously did in March of 2020 with regard to health uh, issues was redundant of authority that you would have had anyway. Is that true? Uh, that that is my interpretation of the code. Yes. Okay. So even if we were to rescind that motion, you would still and somebody's operating, you know, in an unsanitary way, selling contaminated food or something, you would still have your ability to enforce uh, the same way that you you currently do. Yes. Okay. I mean, that I think that clarifies things then for me, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Price, but maybe. I mean, one way you could clarify, you could just say, notwithstanding this this motion, they continue to have this authority, you know, and just just say it outright in case somebody's going to think that because we're rescinding it, that we're rescinding that authority that we explicitly gave. You know, I, I mean, if our city attorney were here, they could answer that question. But I just think that right. that would be there, there is a way to write this so that it's very clear that we're not creating any new authority. We're not taking away that authority. We're doing exactly what we all discussed, which is with the permitting situation, just by saying, you know, notwithstanding this order to rescind it, we are not, you know, rescinding existing authorities under health and safety code. Uh, well, we don't have the city attorney here with us. I, I'm not sure of the uh, effect of, of that. Uh, let me just say from Streets LA that you've heard that we believe we have authority. Um, the previous motion did ask for particular types of 
enforcement protocols, um, you could s affirm that we still have that, you know, basic authority, if you'd like. Um, and our protocols, as sort of indicated by uh, uh, Councilman Krikorian's comments, would remain that, you know, we're under a, a focus of voluntary compliance first, and we'd really be providing the citations and whatnot, really under these egregious situations and situations of public health and safety, we would still have public health and safety, you know, authority. So I think stating that is, um, is fine. Uh, uh, either way, we would be making the case that we'd still have a general authority, but not, not simply directed by this COVID um, guidance to have, you know, a, a particular emphasis inside this program. Okay, is that, is that a friendly motion, Mr. Bloomfield, to add that language? Notwithstanding? Yes. Uh, if, if you accept it as such, absolutely. I'll, I'll accept it as a friendly amendment. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lid, please call the roll. I uh, guess before we do, just uh, one question of clarification. So on the motion itself, are we approving the report back provision, the second piece, and not approving yes. the first piece? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, Councilmember Price? Aye. Councilmember Krikorian? Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield? Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Robin? Yes. Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. Very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you members, and thank you, uh, city family, uh, as we continue to work through uh, this important issue. Thank okay, you. so we're going to uh, research the too. Pardon? I said happy birthday, too. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's uh, directed to Mr. Krikorian. We're going to recess the regular meeting and go into the special meeting. Mr. Clerk, would you call the roll? Yes. Councilmember Price? Here. Councilmember Krikorian? Here. Councilmember Blumenfield? Blumenfield present. Councilmember Robin? Here. Councilmember Harris Dawson? Present. Okay, we're going to open uh, public comment on uh, all three items. Mr. Lynn, would you give us the instructions, please? Yes. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the special agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-177-1578 and then press the pound key. Press the pound key again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. Caller ending in seven, three, two, four, press star six to unmute yourself. Seven, three, two, four, press star six to unmute yourself. Caller ending in 7006, press star 6 to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I unmuted uh, you. Like to speak on? Yes, thank, thank you. It's, uh, well, it's only midnight. <laughs> Which items? Um, all the items and uh, general public comment as well. <laughs> you can only speak on the items you have two minutes to, Mr. No. Yes, okay. So, again, um, yes, thank you to Kern Price. Um, and uh, I attempted to get Mr. Spiller's phone. I believe I sent an email three times to strap that Bible to get you a lawyer. But apparently nobody at the city attorney is working right now. No, they are working. Oh, what are they doing? Oh, they're trying to retaliate against me so that they can get sued again. Oh, good. Let's call the FBI after I'm done with this. Very good. Thank you. So let's see here. Item number one, we have the CRA. I thought we put them out of business. Yes, no more CRA. We're calling on Nithya Raman to ban the CRA from ever coming back here to L.A. Number two, Mr. Business Improvement District, known as De Leon, that's the guy that eats cereal on television at the meetings. Dresses like a bum, doesn't know how to say the Pledge of Allegiance. In other words, 
he'd make a great president one day. So yes, I'm number two. And then number three, Film L.A. Fuck Film L.A. They were allowed outdoor dining while you shut down every single goddamn restaurant. They were out there eating like goats. You should have seen them, Nephia. They were eating like absolute animals out there on 6th and Olive Street. Yes, one thing that these crews do is they overeat. So please put the diet on these people in the Hollywood. They eat too much food and very unhealthy and unsanitary condition. Yes. So no on number three. And again, um, we will try to get you a city attorney. I'm sure one of the 700 of these slobs will come. And then you can reopen the items that you just did. Because I think when you do... That concludes your time. Uh, in order to speak, please press star 9 to raise your hand. Call us, press star 9 to raise your hand. Callers, press star nine to raise your hand. Mr. Chair, that concludes the callers. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for the comment. We're going to close uh, public comment at this time. Uh, members, without objection, I'm going to move that we uh, move items one, two, and three on consent. Seeing no objections, that will be the order. Good. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, what other business is before us at this time? Uh, that clears the desk. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>